So I guess he explained, I was going to explain to you why I did what I did, which is usually the first question that I get, but I guess he did that. So I'm going to read a little bit, and then hopefully we'll have time for a fair number of questions. I think there will be probably quite a few. And I didn't look at the Miami Herald, so I don't know what it said, so I hope it was good. So um, I'm going to start just at the beginning. Um, this is the first place that I went, and this was uh, an urban public hospital. Uh, I sort of tried to do the worst first. Uh, the middle place that I went, I went to three places. The middle place was a hospital in the Midwest, which was a private Catholic hospital. Um, facilities got a lot better. And then the third place was a kind of a new age facility. And um, their emphasis was really on therapy more so than uh, drugs, although they did allow you to bring whatever drugs you were taking, um, legal ones anyway. Um, and uh, so this is, this is sort of me going into the heart of darkness, I guess. Pseudonyms. It began with pseudonyms, hastily scrawled on the dog-eared pages of a paperback book. Words circled, underlined, then crossed out by the exuberant young man who sat next to me that long first night in the ward. His given name was Christos, or so he said, but his pseudonym was Nil. Nil as in nothing, nullity, none. It signified the end point of his quest, the resignation of his ego, and as he said, a far, far better name for a Buddhist, wouldn't you agree? We could not hit on a name for me, or he could not sit still long enough to do so, and I didn't feel quite comfortable with the exercise. I was undercover, after all, but using my own name. I still have that sheet of paper, Possible pseudonyms, it says, written large and slantingly in Nil's hand, leaning sideways across the orderly printed text beneath. I am looking at it now, and in the light of day, or perhaps healthful dissociation, the two P's seem too large, the sibilant S's too small, yet so inspirationally precise, and of course so blatantly, well, insane. Written so imposingly as they are in that distinctive fecal brown Crayola marker, the only pen psych patients at Merriweather Hospital are allowed, these are unforgettable words to me, words as indicative, damning, and admittedly histrionic as abandon all hope. They are the words above the doorway, the words of my descent and of Nils. They say everything and mean nothing. You could make a diagnosis on that basis alone, I suppose, if you were so inclined. As an artifact, Exhibit A, this page would not work much in Nil's favor in court or in a doctor's hands, nor does it paste it in my notebook. It is the thing I turn to when I want to go back to my first night in Merriweather, immediately back, as if transported to the all-night fluorescent lights of the hospital ward shining down on the off-white page Nil scribbling and cocking his head interestedly at his own wild script, all the while explaining Dharma, string theory, and the Four Noble Truths. Nil couldn't sleep, and neither could I. He because he was manic, I because I was terrified, though trying hard not to show it, and because I was bedding down for the night in a fold-out chair. All the gurneys in the hallway were taken, and the hallways were all that we had. U-shaped and lined with gurneys, with small alcoves on each end. One side for the women, one side for the men. The nurse's station in the middle, and alcoves at either end. The alcoves were filled with chair beds, and each had a small picnic table with a TV mounted above it. My chair was commodious, as chairs go, like the contraptions you see in business class on a plane. It probably wouldn't have precluded sleep had it not been for the loud talk and laughter going on just feet away at the picnic table, which the night staff had colonized. They were flipping through tabloid newspapers, trading jokes and insults. Their noise resounded in my head, the noise of a public place. And that is very much how a big city public hospital feels, like an ugly big city public place, a bus station, say, or a restroom in a vagabond park where everything is a bilious green or degraded shade of gray, and nothing quite works the way it's supposed to or is ever really clean, except 
in the strict re strictly antimicrobial sense as when you scorch cement and porcelain with bleach. The noise wasn't the only barrier to sleep. It was freezing in there, too, and all we had to cover us were sheets and paper-thin sky, sky blue pajamas. Hospital issue, all of it, including the Acti Tread stocks, socks with the stick them on the soles. I was wearing two pairs of those, and I had layered on a few extra Johnnies for warmth. Seven hours before, all of my possessions had been taken at the door, put in a gray metal locker, and tagged. I had been sitting in my chair ever since, pretending that I was on a flight to Australia instead of locked by my own doing in the holding pen of emergency psych. I had been working my way up to this for weeks. I hadn't wanted to go. Who wants to go to a psych ward, much less one of the grungiest, scariest ones you can think of? Dumbass journalists doing experiments, that's who. Despite having been to the bin before, I hadn't been at all sure how to commit myself to Merriweather. The first time around, at the end of Self Made Man, I had arranged it through my doctor and had only agreed to go because she knew the place, had trained there, actually, and because, according to US News and World Report, it had been rated one of the best facilities in the country. I had been given the admitting nurse's number, had called, and had been told where and when to present myself for treatment. And of course, I had needed, wanted their treatment. This, on the hand, other hand, was self-inflicted and clinically unnecessary. It was altogether different. I knew no one, I had no connection with the place, and understandably, I was intimidated by its size and what I expected would be its desperate, unclean, cavernous recesses where the unwanted were lost and forgotten. Though I had put myself there purposely and purposefully, the urge to flee set in immediately nonetheless. I didn't want to get lost there or even unduly detained for however long it might take once I'd gotten my story to convince the doctors that I didn't really need to be there. That was the trick, convince them that I did need to be there, stay for at least 10 days, then convince them that I didn't need to be there anymore and do all that without seeming crazier than anyone. I had a history of depression with occasional mild hypomanic episodes, or so the diagnosis of my former private psychiatrist had indicated. But when I had checked myself into Merriweather, I was feeling good, quite good, especially when you consider how scary it is to throw yourself anonymously into what you can't help thinking of, per the liberties of one too many Hollywood movies, as the darkest heart of darkness in the concrete jungle. It was not exactly, I was not exactly depressed, but I had to pretend that I was. A strange exercise for anyone, but especially for a depressive who has spent the bulk of her adult life trying to escape bleak moods, not court them. I wondered, could I talk myself into a trough and when I had, when I had never been able to talk myself out of one? Would faking the mood bring it on for real? Was my disorder that suggestible? And more to the point were the doctors. Certainly I knew what to say and how slowly and disconsolately to say it. Whether I was really well or ill, no one but I could really know. How would the docs tell the difference? As in all psych wards, when you check yourself in with only a backpack to your name, saying you are suicidally depressed, they take you at your word. There is nothing else to go on. Diagnoses are made on hearsay. What you say is what you are, even if you are not a reliable narrator. There is no test, nothing independently verifiable, just the sword play of soft interrogation. I might have told them I was hearing voices, but then they might have given me Seroquel, which is what Nil was taking, or Haldol, or Thorazine, or some other heavyweight antipsychotic that makes you drool and twitch and doze off at the dinner table. But I didn't want to put myself in for that. I could have told them that I had slept with five people in the past day, heard the birds speaking Greek, sold my mother into white slavery and spent the money on dinner. Then they might have opted for Depakote, the big gun of mood stabilizers. But again, I wasn't ripe for that. I'd been on Depakote before. I had gained way too much weight for one and didn't trust what it would do to me. That wasn't the way. But the things you say in psych wards can become a menu for drugs. You have to be careful. I wanted to keep drugs to a minimum, so I reported the virtual truth of my history, depression, possibly bipolar. I was on 20 milligrams of Prozac and hoping to get away with nothing more than a dose boost on that, the devil I knew, and maybe a sedative for the PM. 